Chicago and Philadelphia, which is uh, where people are here. Favorite season? Fall. Summer. I was born Are you liking this? I, well, I, I, yes, I know how to deal with it. I was born in the summer. It's always been my favorite time of the year. Oh, I know. Oh, oh, my little Canadian <laughs> heart is hurting right now. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, one last question and then we'll formally start. Favorite time period in books that you read? Read, not write, read. Oh, and it's the Regency. I love the Napoleonic era. There was so much going on. Okay. And, and for me, it's it's contemporary. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, whether it's the late 20th century or where we are now. So Not much a big happened. surprise. <laughs> <laughs> well, that falls right in line with how you write. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, let's get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for joining us at the July Love at the Lively Book Club brought to you by Sourcebooks and Baker and & Taylor. My name's Dina Halick and I'm the head of the fiction department at the central branch of the Free Library of Philadelphia. And I am thrilled to be here with Sandra Kitt and Anna Harrington. Unfortunately, Ronnie Lauren, who was supposed to be here as well, is sick and isn't able to join us. So hopefully she will be better really soon. We're pulling for you. I had so many things I wanted to talk to her about. Hopefully we'll be able to get to do that another day. So. Before we begin our discussion, I have a few housekeeping things to make sure that you're aware of. At the end of today's event, we will pick three lucky winners of a romance prize pack of the people who are in attendance right now to thank you for registering and attending. And those will be announced at the end of the program. Also, we encourage you to submit your questions for our wonderful, wonderful authors through the Google form link which is provided in chat and it's there already. Caitlin has put it up there. We're doing the questions this way today instead of through Zoom directly as part of event security. So thanks for understanding. Go to the link, put in your questions and we will be, uh, the three of us will get them and we'll, we'll try to answer every question that you have. Okay? Okay, so let's start. Sandra Kitt. Yes. A legend. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I have been looking at your book cover since I was a small child. I'm very excited about that. When I found out you were going to be here today, I'm like, ah! I remember you on my mom's night table when I was 10. Thank you. Thank so, you. Good thank you so much for coming. You are, you are, she is the author of more than 20 novels, including the acclaimed and best-selling The Color of Love. Her work has been nominated for the NAACP Image Award and has appeared on the Essence and Blackboard bestseller lists. She's the recipient of the Romantic Times Lifetime Achievement Award, yay, and the Zora Neale Hurston Literary Award. And um, she lives in New York City, enjoying the steamy heat and humidity yes. that we have yes. right now. Yes. And we also have Anna Harrington, who also <laughs> writes award-winning novels. She writes Regency romances. She is a Rita finalist in 2017. Her debut, Dukes Are Forever, won the 2016 Maggie Award for Best Historical Romance. And all about, all about Romance, the website named her Best Debut Historical Romance Author for her first series, The Secret Life of Scoundrels. She's a lover of all things chocolate and coffee. That's yeah. one out of the two things I love. When <laughs> she is not hard at work writing her next book or planning her next series, she loves to fly airplanes. Oh my God, why did we not talk about that earlier? We'll get to that later. <laughs> Go ballroom dancing or tend to her roses. We'll talk about her roses too. She has a lot. She is an English professor in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Yes. So that means you literally live on the side of a mountain, right? I literally live on the side of a mountain. Yes. So, that is amazing. So the sun doesn't actually hit my house until 10 a.m. in the morning because it has to clear the mountain first before it hits my house. I'm not kidding. Yep. And Sandra and I are both completely urban and we're like, what is this nature you're talking about? Right. <laughs> <laughs> the sun hits my house at like seven in the morning because all my windows face east. So I get early sunlight. Oh, yes. that's lovely. <laughs> So hello to both of you. Thank you so much for joining us. And we have, I think, a jam-packed program of things that we want to talk about. So let's start, just first, let's talk a little about your books. You both have new books. Tell me a little bit about the book that you have coming out. 
What's it about? What can people expect? Just pimp out your stuff. Sandra, you go first. Okay, well, the, uh, the book that's out right now is called Winner Takes All, contemporary action takes place mostly in New York City. And it's about a lottery winner. Um, not only did he win the lottery, he won a boatload of money, just ridiculous amounts. Mm -hmm. And um, he actually is kind of embarrassed about having won so much money because he had a very nice career to begin with. But he begins to realize how having so much money, particularly if it's unearned, causes problems. Um, people are asking for things for you, people that you don't know, uh, total strangers, relatives you haven't seen in centuries, old girlfriends who are hoping to reconnect. It gets pretty dicey at times and he has to deal with it. And the heroine who kind of holds his hand and helps him through imploding over all of this is someone who had also mentored him in high school. They were just friends. She got him through his senior year. And now that they've reconnected, um, it's an adult relationship and an adult opportunity to really get to know each other. And they have a, quite a lot of really fun adventures in the story because he has the money to do it. Uh, and she also was there to kind of help him deal with a lot of problems. Story is very layered. It also has as a subplot, her parents um, and a couple of other surprises in the story that a couple of people told me they never saw coming. So I like that aspect of it. Um, and I, there's another book coming out. I don't think it'll be out until 2022, which oh, also preview. the issue of coming into a lot of money that is unearned. In this second book, it happens to be an inheritance, which also has this levels of complications. I had to do a lot of research about what people do with a lot of money and the kind of problems it can cause. We should all have so many problems. Right. <laughs> Anna, tell us about your book. Well, I am right in the middle of a series called Lords of the Armory, and it was loosely inspired by Marvel comic book heroes. So I always describe it, especially the last book that just came out, um, um, An Extraordinary Lord. I say it's Van Helsing meets Spider-Man meets Jane Austen. So it is um, set in the darker streets and darker side of London in the days following the end of the Napoleonic Wars. It's about a group of soldiers who have come back from the peninsula. They don't have purpose in their lives. They can't adapt to being back to this new life back in England. Everything's changed. People don't understand what they've gone through. Kind of what a lot of soldiers go through even today when they've been serving overseas. And they discover that there's a secret plot to overthrow the monarch and put a puppet ruler in place, an evil group called Scepter. And they have decided to uh, band together and stop the new revolution. And this is this is a Regency romance, yes, right? Yes, oh, oh yeah, definitely. It's Regency romance, but it's got sword fighting in it. It's got female peace takers. It's got riots. Um, they shoot the bridge and London Bridge and they go under it in the middle of the rapids. Um, it's a little bit of everything, but um, it's fun. It's it still has afternoon tea and it still has drawing room balls and gowns and all the fun stuff of, of the Regency period. But then it also um, has a bit of thriller mixed in as well. That is so cool. So. <laughs> I know I've read, I've read, I've read the latest one or I've read, I read the latest one. I've read the one that I've been, okay. we'll talk so, about it. Yeah, so the, the first one I think that I, I think most people would want me to talk about is um, An Inconvenient Duke, and that's the first one in the series. Um, and he comes back from the war, he's sort of like Wellington, they make him a duke, he doesn't know what to do with his life, and he discovers that his sister has been murdered, and he wants to find the person responsible, and that leads him to his sister's best friend, Danielle, who unbeknownst to him is leading a secret organization called Nightingale, which helps abused women escape their abusers. And so it, the plot just sort of unfolds from there. They're both keeping secrets. They don't trust each other, but of course they're madly in love and eventually hijinks ensue and happily ever after. You, it, it's weird to say hijinks ensue when there's like <laughs> a murder and helping people escape from domestic abuse. 
Yeah. But yes, I've read it. There are hijinks. There um, are hijinks. Yeah, there lots, are hijinks. Lots, lots of things happen. It is definitely a page turner. Um, some a reader emailed me and said, I read it all in one night because when I reached the end of a chapter, you just kept going into the next one and I couldn't put it down. I think that's the biggest compliment I could get. I think based on like both of you are writing books about some very extreme, st like winning a lot of money or a secret society of women who are helping other women escape domestic abuse in the Regency era. How do you do your research for this? Like where do you find all that information? What made you want to do that in the first place? Anna, let's start with you because I'm, I'm on the secret society kick okay. right now. You want to start with me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I was having drinks with friends in a bar and <laughs> they had mentioned how much they loved new Marvel com comic movies. And I said, they're great, but I love history. And they said, wouldn't it be great if you could find a way to mesh the two together? And I thought about it and I realized that these these comic book heroes are not that much different from our traditional heroes we, we love and adore, no matter what time period they've been put in. So that's what started the idea. And then to do the research, it was just thank God for Google, because you can find anything out there these days. Thank God for Google and thank God for the people that take the time to put the information up there so I can find it. So it was things like revolutionary groups in 1815 London and I would get you know pages and pages and that's where it started and it just went from there. Um, Nightingale is completely made up but I thought wouldn't it be wonderful if she was not only trying to reform the system and stop abuse from happening but was also helping to rescue the women who were already caught up in it and so that's how that sort of unfolded. Interesting and Sandra I'm just going to assume and you can lie to me if you want, you have not won millions of dollars in a lottery. No, I have not <laughs> won millions of dollars or even $10 in the lottery, unfortunately. So uh, working on the book gave me an opportunity to imagine, you know, what would you do if you won the lottery? Um, and I did do research on that actually and found that uh, there is a history of people really squandering whatever they've won through the lottery. Uh, and one of the things I learned from doing my research is that if you win a lot of money or you're given a lot of money, you don't talk about it. You don't talk about it to anyone until you've had a chance to talk to some professionals and figure out what it is you want to do and get some advice. Um, but it was interesting to find out how many people really just went through all of their money very, very quickly. And obviously I didn't want that to happen to my hero. So, um, but he did have to decide what it is he was going to do with this money. And pro one of the premises of the story for me was, again, to explore the whole fact, the whole issue of coming into a great deal of wealth, totally unexpected, totally unearned, and really realistically, what do you do with, how much money can you possibly spend? And so I thought it would be nice if he began to develop a kind of philanthropic mindset. He didn't come to it on his own. That's what we had the heroine for. But he began to realize that he could use the money for a lot of good. And, that, and that's eventually what happens in the story. Uh, that, that's the, the, the main uh, thrust of, of the novel. Um, as I said, there is a, um, a subplot with the heroine's parents and I don't want to give too much of that away because I do want people to read the book, but it has to do with her parentage and her background and, um, and you know, how she started life and where she is now, all of which who she is and what she is, is really is kind of relevant to the story as well. But it was the money aspect, which really was the um, propel the story forward. So in both of the books, your, your two main characters do have a history with each other. They aren't like, oh, I've met you for the first time and it's love at first sight. They, they have a pre-existing relationship in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Do you enjoy writing characters that aren't like, bam, first impressions, here you are? I think it's more challenging if they're just meeting uh, <laughs> and, and you have to figure out what is it and essentially that draws them together. Um, because you know they, these are presumably adults, they don't know anything about each other. Is there a spark right away? 
Is it hate at first sight? And then how do you get over that? Um, and I, I think when I, when I think about it realistically, really most of my books are that. They, they come to the beginning of the story. They've never seen each other before. It's all new. Um, this is one of the very, very few books, I can count them all on one hand, where the hero and heroine knew each other to some extent be before the story started. And they were much younger, or maybe there was just a few years um, you know, introduction. Um, and this was a case where there was no romantic intent between them. They were high school classmates. And the way they came together was purely about the academics and him getting out of high school and her helping him to do it. So when they meet up again at the announcement of his lottery winning, they already have a foundation. They already recognize each other and, and that recognition and what they were together at first as high school students begins to help them really sort of bridge the gap quite quickly. And they can begin as adults to take the relationship to another level. And I find it difficult to write meet cute where they've never met before because they don't know how to interact with each other. If you think about it, when you meet a stranger on the street, you don't really know how to interact with that person. But if it's someone you know, then the sparks can fly from the very beginning. If it's friendship, if it's enemies to lovers, whatever the, the trope is, um, that sort of built in if they already know each other. It's a, it's a nice little leg up on writing the, the plot. And, and I do want to apologize. My phone rang. I think I'm the only person in the world who still has a landline and doesn't have a cell phone. This is why I write historicals. <laughs> <laughs> Never right. heard it. I don't think I heard it, so. Good, thank I you. I didn't hear it either. If you hadn't said anything, you would never have known. <laughs> I didn't say I no. <laughs> so the theme for this month is New Beginnings. So can you talk about what that means for the characters in your book? I think, Sandra, you have a very definite new beginning uh, in yours. I, I, I do. Um, some people have referred to it as a second chance at love, which I wasn't sure if was really accurate because they were never in love to begin with. They were teenagers. Um, but um, coming back together again, as I said, allows them to kind of make a, a, a leap uh, into time where they can bridge very quickly the times when they were like 16, 18 years old to now they're young adults, you know, basically twice as many years later, uh, double the number of years. And um, I, I think because they come together again as adults, they also have adult history, not together, but they've, they've been in romances. They've, you know, the heroine used to be in, engaged at one point, the hero had been married and divorced. So they, you know, they've had the experience of, of first love and first romance and coming together again, because they have this basic familiarity with each other allows them to sort of get back into it very, very quickly. There's always, there's already the trust at level that has been bridged. There's already familiarity and the history between them as light as it may be. It allows them to feel very, very comfortable very quickly. And so they realize very quickly that they really do want to see where this can go now. Uh, so we, we get to skip a whole lot of years and Sturm and Drang and things going on where you're still growing up and you're still a young adult trying to find your, your footing in, uh, in, in life and with relationships. Uh, they were able to kind of bypass a lot of that early stuff and just really come at it as adults. And so Anna, your character, your hero, who's coming back from the war, that is almost quite literally a brand new beginning. It's a brand new beginning. Um, and so a lot of what gets explored in this book, and, and not just for Marcus, but for Danielle as well, is what it means when you're starting over and you have to leave behind your past everything you know, your identity, your purpose in life, because it's, it's terrifying. We like to think of new beginnings sometimes as this wonderful, exciting moment in our life, and that's true, but it also comes with some, some terror behind it, and so they're dealing with that, and I, I also love studying it in 1815, because in 1815, the world was a new beginning. Europe had been completely rewritten, politically, economically, socially, revolutions were starting to happen that would culminate just 
30 years later in 1848, we already had the, the US, now finally a new country able to stand up to the European powers in 1815 everything is changing. This is not their parents' world anymore. And it's really, really terrifying to try and find your way in this world when all of the way markers that you've been raised and trained to follow aren't there anymore. Hmm. Why Regency, Anna? Why Regency? Oh gosh, um, it's my favorite historical period. I didn't lie about that earlier um, because there's so much going on in, in that time period. I like to tell my students because I, I teach humanities and I teach history. I like to tell them if we took someone from 2000, if we took someone from 1921 and we took them out of history and we put them in 2021, the world would not be that much different. They had cars, airplanes, telephones. Yeah, they didn't put them in their pocket and walk around with them, but they could talk into them. They knew how the world worked. If you take someone from 1721 and put them in 1821, the world is completely different. They would never recognize it. So much change happened from 1810 to 1820 that the world was never the same again. You know, politically, economically, everything changed. Um, this is the, the time when women are starting to be educated outside of the home. This is the time when people are speaking out and saying everyone should have the vote, not just wealthy landowners. Technology is changing. It's the the, the height of the industrial revolution right before it starts to go bad with the factories and the slums and the things we associate with Dick the Victorian period. And you have all of that against the background of Jane Austen. So you've got all of these wonderful changes going on in the world. And yet you've got order, aristocracy, class, manners, everything that we associate with the finer things of life they're part of, it's part of that as well. So I just, I love it. I feel like you can do just about anything in the Regency time period. And it may strike readers as a little weird at first. They're like, what do you mean? You've got a woman wielding a sword in downtown London? Well, yeah, but it wouldn't have been that unusual. Women did carry swords back then, just not a lot of them. So I love it. I, I love, you know, pushing the boundaries and seeing what, how far I can take it. But it's also just to me, one of the most exciting time periods in history. Hmm. And Sandra, I know you started out reading historicals, yeah. but you don't write them. Why, why do you write the era that you write? I, yeah, I did start out reading historicals and I have some favorite writers. Uh, uh, Patricia Varian, um, if, if you haven't heard the name, you really need to, to look up some of her works. She was British, came to America, continued to write, married an American. She died really some 20 years ago, but her, her work was just extraordinary. Um, but I, as much as I love the historicals, I, I knew that I didn't have the patience to, to write, you know, history and to be that details about the way things were back then, mm -hmm. whether it was European history or American history. I just, that wasn't, I didn't want to go back and revisit history. I wanted to move forward. I was always more interested in the future. So my stories are contemporary. I write about where we are now. I write about the constant changing of now uh, and you know the way America has changed, the way the population has changed, the mores, the difficulties, the social issues. Um, and my stories um, to that extent are not always, they don't start out to be romances. They start out to talk about things that are happening in our society, but there's always a really, really strong romantic interest in the stories. And when I came into the industry, if you wrote any kind of story that had a love interest in it, you were a romance writer. So here I am. So you're like a romance writer by default? And yeah, by default, you know, they just <laughs> whack a me into the box. Um, so, and, and I was interested in that because I'm, I'm, I really wanted to know about the dynamics of relationships. And I felt that I could explore that best in the contemporary world because it's the world that I grew up in. Um, you know, what is it really that brings a man and a woman together? Where does that spark first begin? Or where do they first begin to get over their difficulties? You know, maybe they didn't initially like each other. 
um, that kind of uh, dynamic, relationship dynamic really influenced me. And um, it seemed more relevant to me in the contemporary voice. So that's why I do it. And I know that when I write my contemporary stories, I am looking forward. I am looking ahead towards the future and sort of imagining us, this is where we are now, but what if when we got to that place, something else has gone on and changed and, and you know, brings about a different kind of story. For me, that happens constantly just by paying attention to what's going on in our country and the world today. You know, before I know what it's gonna be tomorrow and next week and it's gonna be different. So let's kind of take that and twist it, not twist it, but let's kind of go on that is how has the definition of romance evolved over the years? You said, Sandra, you didn't, you, it, there was a strong romantic theme in there. So they said you were romance. Romances have changed so much. Let's talk yeah. about that a bit. Well, I mean, I think I sort of realized that um, from some of the response I actually get to some of my more recent books. Um, and this is just my perception that the readers want stories that are um, more hard hitting. They want women who are badasses, who are perfectly capable of taking down the hero if she has to, yep. but certainly capable of taking care of herself. None of which I mind if he's an alpha male and there certainly is a lot of appeal to that type of man. But I also wanna see a side that for as strong as he is, he is also very, tender and he could be kind and gentle. And I personally feel that a man's greatest strength is in his ability to be gentle because it may not be inherently part of the way we raise men or what we expect of men and of boys. So if you meet a guy who comes across with that, you know, he can really take care of everything, but he can also be there for you when, you know, to be kind and gentle and understanding. To me, he's got it all. He just mm -hmm. really has it all at that point. Um, I, I feel that the way also r romances have changed is I don't feel an experience as a reader, not a writer, as a reader, that sense of tenderness. For me, a lot of romance is what you're feeling as you're experiencing these changes, as you're meeting someone that you really like and you're wondering, does he like you or how can you get him to like you? I want to feel what it's like when you first make eye contact and you say, oh, there's something going on here. This something could be developed into something. I want to feel what it's like the first time he touches her or the first time he pulls her in her arms, uh, yes. his arms, or the first time she puts her arms around him, the first time mm -hmm. they kiss. It's not about the words. It's not about the description. It's about what they evoke. And I want to feel that. I want to feel, oh my goodness, I wish I was in her place and he was kissing me. You know, years ago, I remember a writer at a conference saying, if she says, when I'm writing a love scene, a sex scene, she says, if I don't get hot and turned on while I'm writing it and while I'm reading, she said, I'm doing something wrong because they, that's part of what she wants to feel. And I think that's part of what a lot of readers of romances want. They want to vicariously live through that delicious feeling that just mm -hmm. washes through you when you're falling in love, when you're becoming attracted to someone. That's yeah. a feeling. And, and I, I want to see that described. And I, I think that um, sometimes I don't see that I'm, I'm not gonna mention it, I, the author or the book. I just finished a book re recently, which was um, really hot and really heavy, <clears throat> but it was, um, I really felt it was a lot of sex, but there wasn't a lot of love. Mm -hmm. And I didn't believe the, the chemistry that was supposed to have brought this man and this woman together. I felt I was just reading words telling me that they did this and they did that and it, lasted this long and then, you know, blah, 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 but I didn't feel it. And for me, romance is the feeling of being in love, not the description right. of it. It's, I, it's I, couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more, Sandra. And the best piece of advice that I can give to new romance writers, especially when they're writing sex scenes, because people have a hard time with it because of the intimacy of it and everything. Yeah. It's not about where the hands go, it's about where the heart goes. Thank you. 
It is all about the emotion. And if you don't have that emotion in there, why are you writing that scene? So you've got to have it. And, and every bit of your book has to be um, increasing in emotion, yes. higher stake all the way through. You have to convince people from the very beginning, even if they're having sex by chapter five, that this relationship might still fall apart. That happily ever after is not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed. Right. It's not guaranteed. Now, we know that it is. By the time we get to the end, it's guaranteed. But the journey but you there. Want to anticipate it. You want them to come along for their journey of the, of the mm -hmm. characters. You know, well, what if it doesn't work? What if that happens and then it all falls apart? So that sense of feeling and keeping that feeling alive is part of what drives the story. That's right. You, know, and you have to up the ante at, at every encounter between them. It's got to be a little bit more, a little bit more, and, and until you're almost crazed with wanting your <laughs> yourself. Exactly. Yes. And, and, and another thing, I don't mean to devolve this into a workshop on craft, but a lot of new writers also don't realize that if you have multiple sex scenes in your book, they should increase in intensity and emotional stake as the book goes on. You shouldn't have a big sex scene midway through and then also sex then a couple of chapters later if it doesn't increase if it stake. has to increase in intensity and exactly. desire. And exactly. Desire. Exactly. So, um, yeah. <laughs> So, so I actually have a question that might fit in very well right here is uh, what's your favorite heat level to write in your books? I'm sorry, repeat that. What is your favorite heat level? Um, I, I would say pretty hot. Um, the stories are, my stories are explicit in that they do describe the body parts and where things go and, and, and all of that. But the heat level still comes into the way the characters are reacting to what's going on, what's happening to them. Mm -hmm. You know, the sounds that they're making, the movement of their bodies, uh, the whispers, the moans. Um, I, I, for me, it's important to describe those so that the reader reading can hear it. And if they hear it, they can imagine feeling that way themselves. That's you know, right. I, I tell, I, you know, my favorite writing tool is my thesaurus because <laughs> it gives me so many other words that I could use, right? Instead of doing this you know, the same thing over and over again. Right, yeah. right. I actually keep a writer's file on a word file on my computer of, of words that if I, if I read along and they refer to a, a body part a certain way, because they're do's and don'ts with body parts. Um, I like to put that into my file. So I've got it sort of like my own thesaurus. Um, Mine's probably four out of five on the heat scale. I'm just shy of erotica, but not close to it. But I was banned at Walmart. Uh, what? Walmart refuses to carry one of my books yeah. because it opens with an oral sex scene. Yeah. Now, the whole point of the, the oral sex scene, it's not graphic at all. It just it opens with it is because we're establishing the hero as this devil may care playboy rogue who doesn't know how to care. take care of women. Knows That's how to right. Them. Right, right. To get his own pleasure, right? right? And so the book is a journey from him realizing that it's not about him, it's about the woman he loves. And so you have to kind of start with that scene. Um, odd that they refuse to carry my book when they allow Fifty Shades of Grey, but yeah, they, they don't have it. It's not allowed on there. You can't find it at Walmart. Well, it's also marketing. I mean, let's face it's it. It's marketing. Right between, uh, not to get off on uh, Shades of uh, mm -hmm. Shades of Grey, Mm -hmm. um, is that it got so much hype. There yes. was an audience for it. It didn't That's matter right. how much sex it had. It, you know, the, the, the store knew that there was a market for it and they were trying That's to sell right. books. That's right. So you have to look at it purely in that sense. Yeah, I mean, I, That's I, true. I, I, that I, is I, true. I think the, the book, second book that I did that will be hopefully coming out next year, I remember getting a note from someone um, saying, but this was in-house, saying that um, this, this scene seems a little bit hotter than what we've seen from you before. Could you tamp it down a bit? So I went back mm -hmm. and I read, I read it and I'm thinking, did I miss something here? Yeah. <laughs> really? They consider this hot? And I'm thinking of where I could have taken it. But um, you know, it's, it's a little bit subjective as well. You know, what's hot and what's hot and then what's hot and what's not. That's right. Um, 
Yeah. And a lot of times people confuse heat level with sexual tension. Uh, exactly. um, what, what, one of the books that, that I wrote that readers um, always tell me is, you know, one of the hottest books that I've written, they only have sex once. And it's not that unusual of a sex scene, but well, maybe it's the anticipation that you built up. And yes. when it finally got to that, they're going, oh my God, you know, it's just, I mean, this is, yeah. Wild. I feel like we're getting a masterclass in how to write sex scenes and stuff here. This is awesome. Let's go back. And how did you become romance readers? Like you, you've now got a very sophisticated palette, but what, where did you start? I started when I was probably in junior high school. And again, the books that I were reading at that time were historicals. They called them Gothic romances. Oh. So they were all set in Europe. Um, the, the heroines were always 17, 18 years old. And the hero was always the older man. She was always running across the moors in her nightgown. And he always lived in this drafty old castle. But they were just wonderfully romantic to, to me because I could see what was developing emotionally between the two main characters. That's what riveted me, was that relationship developing between the two of them. One of the things I realized, and, and this subsequently came out in, a, um, in something that I was doing when I was in college and I was still reading a lot of these books. And I remember some, some um, teachers and women that I knew complaining about how awful romances were. And I said, don't you realize that for a teenage girl, this is the first time they're reading stories where they read about the possibilities of real love and real togetherness. Yep. You know, there's no abuse, there's no profanity. The stories are, in and of themselves are very kind of middle class, mm -hmm. you know, so everyone, most people, particularly if you're a reader, can pretty much be on that level. I said, this is the first time that a, ch a girl of 13 through 18 is reading about a positive relationship and what it is she could have for herself. Instead of putting up with a guy who doesn't pay any attention to her, he doesn't show up when he says he's going to, he never takes her out, he calls her names, whatever you wanna call it that she's experiencing where she is in time and in her life and in her world, she can read that there's something better and something she could actually strive for. The romance novels are always going to have a positive ending, always. They are always going to work out whatever the issue was between them and decide at the end, you're the one that I want. And I think if a young girl comes away from a book with that feeling, she's going to respect, hopefully, what it is she deserves and what it is she wants for herself in a romantic relationship. So I, I thought as a teenager, the, <laughs> the books served a very educational purpose. It's yes. your first introduction to what a good relationship is. Yes, and it's a safe space for these young girls to explore um, love and feelings of emotion and what it's like to care for each other because it does have that happily ever after ending. It's safe for them to project themselves into the heroine yeah. and live this other life for a few days, a few hours, um, where they're not going to get that in the real world. It's a lot harsher. And it's almost like, I always call it a step up in fairy tale. When I got tired of reading fairy tales, the next happily ever after were romances. And so it was just a natural segue. It wasn't all I was reading. I was reading Shakespeare. I was reading yeah, everything. I was reading lots of things, but it, it was the continuation of that fairy tale where right. you knew in the end things were going to turn out well. She was going to live happily ever after. She was going to be loved. Everything was going to be special. And I think that's what really pulls us in. It's, it's escapism and we love it for it. Yeah. And what made you decide to write? <laughs> I, you know, that wasn't on my game plan list to become a writer. <clears throat> I was a voracious reader always from the time I was six or seven years old, but it was pure happenstance that brought me to writing my first book. And literally it happened like that. Just something I saw in New York <laughs> outside of Bloomingdale's. And I don't, I, it's too long a story to go into, but there was this young man who was sitting on the curb outside the store 
and he was clearly down on his luck. And when I saw him, what resonated to me was not that he was dirty and his hair was over long and you know, maybe he needed a bath. It was the sense that something had gone on wrong in his life that had affected him, either made him very unhappy, very sad, very lost, and this is where he was, okay? So I went home that night and started writing my book and it had nothing to do with a derelict. Hmm. It started with someone who was in a situation where he, he had had a loss and it had affected him emotionally. And when he was discovered by the heroine, she connected emotionally to that. Something had happened to him and, he, and that's why he was where he was. And that's what started the story. Um, I didn't tell anyone what I was doing because I didn't know what I was doing. I just was writing. Six weeks later, I had finished the full first draft of the story. It was over a hundred thousand words. I mean, I was just writing. It just poured out of me, just poured out of me. And I thought that that was it. But halfway through that first book, I got an idea for a second one. So I finished the first book and I started writing the second one. And halfway through that, I got an idea for the third book. And that's how I decided at that moment, I guess I'm going to be writing because I have all of these stories and all of these characters in my head. And it was only after I finished the third book that I then said, let me see if I could get any of this published. And that led me into meeting in a very weird way, Vivian Stevens, <laughs> you know, the founder of RWA. And, um, and I was off and running. She published my first two books and I was off and running. My foot in the door, my introduction to getting published was really magical. It was immediate. And, um, and I was off and running and I had all these ideas. And um, my only problem right now is that I'm never gonna live long enough to write all of them. So I consider myself very lucky in that regard, you know, that I do have a lot of ideas. Well, that, that's a depressing way to end that anecdote. <laughs> Thank you. Uh <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to prepare. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Anna, what about you? How did you start? Um, I've actually been writing romances for about five years, maybe six. Um, and it started the way, I, I know it sounds cliche, but I, I was writing before that. I was doing literary, I was doing poetry, short stories, literary novels, that sort of thing. Lots of academic papers. So I, I knew how to write and craft a story. It never occurred to me that there was this other world of romance. I mean, I had read contemporary romances growing up. I had read, you know, all the, um, the Harlequins, the silhouette books I could get my hands on when I was a teenager and in my 20s. But... It wasn't until I read Judith McNaught, her books, um, that there was such a thing as a Regency romance, which was a thing. And I, I read all of her books that I could get my hands on. I read lots of other people. I read Julia Quinn, Sabrina Jeffries, everybody. But I wasn't really getting the kind of books that I wanted to read. And I know it's a cliche, you hear readers say that, you write the kind of book that you want to read. And, and that's what I did because I wanted a very strong heroine who fell in love and got married because she wanted to, not because she had to, not because she wanted to have babies and get married or society told her to do that. All of my heroines have careers, they have jobs, they have work, they have responsibilities, sometimes it's secret societies, but they have this other purpose in life. And that's what I wanted. I wanted the Regency world. I wanted the carriages and the ball gowns and the, the dashing heroes and, and the house parties and everything you get in that world. But I also wanted um, that feminist sort of heroine. And so that's why I started writing them. And so I wrote the first one and I got my agent. I didn't know what I was doing. And I got my agent and she told me, she said, well, you know, um, what else do you have? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, publishers for romances want to buy series. They don't just want to buy one book. So what are the other books in this series? And I was like, you mean I have to do this again? I was like, I, 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 
it was a crash course in writing romance and, and what publishers were looking for. And I just sort of stumbled blindly into it uh, because I'd had all that experience writing in the other genres. Um, so I got lucky that way with craft. And then it was just a matter of learning um, the requirements for Regency romance and the tropes. And just like with Sandra, I have so many ideas now mm -hmm. that I could keep writing for another 20, 30 years. And, yeah. and every time you write a book, you get more. Getting because more ideas, yeah. you always have supporting characters that you, you love and you pour your heart and soul into them. And they should get their own stories and their own romance and happily ever after fairy tale too. And so it's hard to stop and if it wasn't the publisher saying okay you need to wrap up this series now we need to move on to something else I think I would still be writing dozens of books in that very first series. Well I think that actually brings up uh we have a question from Renee um in the audience for both of you I guess which is Sandra you've previously written standalone novels what made you decide to do a series and Anna you've written both standalone and series do you prefer one over the other I think you've kind of answered this already but talk standalone versus series um oh they both have their good points it's easier to write a standalone it's, it's so much easier to write a standalone because you don't have to be thinking about what other characters are going to promote this story, what's the story arc through the entire series. Um, so you can just have one couple and focus on one story in, in a standalone. So they're easier to write. But on the other hand, you need characters to populate your world. You need best friends, family, you, you know, the crazy neighbor down the street. Um, the crazy neighbor down the street happens to be, you know, a Madam Brothel, but Brothel Madam, but you know, these, these things happen in Regency time period. And they're just screaming out for their own stories too. The last series that I finished about two years ago before this current one, I still have two more books that need to be written. Um, I, I, I don't know when I'm gonna be able to get back to them because they have characters that were just kind of left there without their own stories. I had a reader who contacted me a couple of days ago and she said, when are they going to get their, their books? And she was writing to me too about the um, Lords of the Armory series, the current one. And she said, please tell me it's not just one more book. She goes, it's gotta be at least four. And she looked at all these characters that needed their own books. And I was like, well, you're going to get three, not necessarily those characters, but now I'm sitting here thinking, I've got to write novellas about all of those too, and somehow work them in, and I don't know how I'm going to do that. So it's kind of like Michelangelo. I don't know if you know the story of Michelangelo. He would do a lot of sculptures, and he would stop halfway through because he had thought that he had freed the spirit inside the block of marble, and that he didn't need to finish them. I have all these spirits inside dozens and dozens and dozens of blocks of marble that are just waiting to be freed. It never ends. Never does. <laughs> and what about you, Sandra, switching from standalones to a series? Well, um, this is beginning with uh, Winner Takes All is actually my first series. Um, I had a book that I wrote for Harlequin um, many, many years ago. It be actually became one of their early classics called Adam and Eva which was the play on Adam and Eve in Paradise. And um, what I did maybe 15 years after that book came out and turned out to be very popular was I aged the little girl in the story, the original one, and she became, along with the original hero and heroine characters in the spinoff. So it was her story, uh, cause she's an adult now, she's a doctor. Um, and her parents, uh, you know, still own a house on this tropical island where they first met. So that you really can't consider it a series. It was just one of those odd one-offs that was a sequel to the first book. Then I was asked to do to take part in a um, continuity series where there were four books with a total of eight characters. So each book had hero, heroine, you know, like that. And um, it was a fictional college and it was a 10th anniversary reunion. And my book was the first one in that continuity series, but I had to use all of the other characters from the other books that hadn't even been written yet. And I had to use the same college campus and you know, uh, putting the whole thing together. So my story was actually the foundation of what the, the rest of the, the other three books were going to be about. 
but again, not really a series. I mean, it is, but I only did the first book. Um, Winner Takes All is, um, had been uh, billed to be a, a trilogy. Um, and the title of the trilogy was The Millionaire's Club. And we already know from the first book and the hero winning all of these millions of dollars, he was the one actually, again, the heroine, thank you, who gave him the idea for forming a club of people who come into extraordinary wealth and decide they wanna do more than shop till they drop. They wanna be able to also give back in some way so they become parts of this club. Um, the second book, because it's now being built as um, one of three, not really a trilogy, uh, I mean, run of two. Uh, the second book is in, about inheritance. And, um, and it's, it's a little bit complicated, but the hero and the heroine had a mutual person that they both knew in their lives without them knowing each other. And he died and left significant money to both of them. Plus he left his business to the male, the hero of the story who happened to have been his stepson. Okay, so again, you know, there, there's this whole issue about what do they do with all of this money? And, uh, and it was really fun trying to think of ways of how to spend money. And let me tell you something, <laughs> it really wasn't all that easy. What I found out, again, from my research is people who have a lot of money, who gained a lot of money, the ones who are really smarter about it than lottery winners tend to be, do not go out and do a lot of shopping and buy crazy things. They really don't change their lifestyles very much. They kind of stay very low key. They may decide, you know, maybe I'm gonna get a new car. You know, my Honda is really on its last breath and I'd love to have something more, you know, interesting as a car. And they may take a vacation. They're not gonna go out and buy an island. You know, they're not gonna buy a house in every state. They don't do things like that. They tend to really just live a little bit under the radar. So I had to find a way of doing things that were fun just because you have the money to have a lot of fun. But I also had to find things that you would do that were, may not seem all that impressive, but does require expense, you know, expenditure of money. So for me, that was the fun part of it. So um, the book that's coming out in uh, next year will kind of cover that same theme of you have a lot of money, what are you gonna do with it? Nice. And, and I am interested to see what happens. Because okay. I, I'm like, I was happy if I won like millions of dollars, what would I do? What would you do with it? Yeah. So Anna, we have a question from Donna for you. She said that you mentioned channeling your Jane Austen love into your book. If Jane Austen were writing today with her uncanny understanding of societal pressures and people's natures, what kind of books do you think she'd be writing? Science fiction. Science fiction. I really think she would be doing science fiction because that is where the cutting edge technology is going. Um, we don't stop to think about it, but you know, she's conquered romance already. And I think she would be pushing the, the envelope with um, another genre talking about, you know, the future, like Sandra had said, you know, the future is always so interesting. What's gonna happen? Uh, what's the technology going to take us? Um, what does it mean for these relationships? I mean, we see it now in our own lives. Think about how Facebook and social media has changed our personal relationships. Mm -hmm. And that's the both to think about all the things that we're going to be faced with in the next 50 to 75 years that you all will be faced with in the next 50 to 75 years. Um, but so it's, I think that's what she would be doing. I really do. Hmm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I want to go back just about how you're writing historical novels, but you were writing the novels with the heroines you wanted. Yeah. is how do you write a historical novel for a modern reader? Um, I think you have to, to a certain extent, um, because a modern reader, we exist in the modern contemporary world. We still have modern contemporary sensibilities. If you try, to, I tried to write Jane Austen book where they were concerned about getting the house and the husband and in that order by the way, you've ever read Jane Austen, her characters are more concerned about status and money than they are about the love that they eventually get. They all want to decorate a, a parish, for some reason, a parish um, parsonage, I can't figure that out. But um, so 
you can't have that in a modern book. We, in a modern um, contemporary society, even though people know they're reading these historical books, they want heroines that want more out of life than just getting married and having babies and decorating the drawing room. They want heroines that they can live vicariously through. So that means women who are strong, independent, more than capable or on their own, who fall in love because they want to, not because they think they have to, right? Or because that's what society expects them to do. And so that's already with the characters, even though we talk about alpha males and we want, you know, the Regency is the prime alpha male, right? Um, we still expect our heroes to be soft, considerate, tender, um, especially in the last few years. Um, I, it has to be seen as incredibly consensual. They can't even kiss the heroine now without her consent um, because everything has changed and we expect that now. Those are our norms. <coughs> when, when I do um, dialogue, I, um, my dialogue is 21st century American dialogue. You would hear these people talking this way down at your, your local bar, same contractions, different slang, right? I try to stay true to the historical accuracy of some of the words and nouns and, and verbs and phrases. But for the most part, the cadence, it has to fit that voice that we have in our heads. And the voice we carry in our heads when we read is a modern voice. Don't believe me? I dare anyone to read Pamela and try to read it. Go from reading a contemporary book and then try to pick up Pamela and read it and it will do weird things to your head because it's not that contemporary narrative voice. And I don't want my readers to be pulled out of the novel, which you are when you start into a Jane Austen, when you start into um, um, Pamela and those types of, of novels from a little bit before that in the period. I want them to become lost in the characters and what's happening in the emotions. And the only way to do that is to write it in that modern narrative voice that they expect and they hear in their heads. Okay, so I've got a couple of more questions. Um, one from Elizabeth. Uh, I'm gonna start with Sandra because I feel like this might be aimed at you. If you won the lottery, what would you do with the money? <laughs> I knew that sooner or later that would surface. Uh, I cannot tell you how much time I, I spent directing that question at myself. And um, for me, it's still very, very difficult because I, I don't like to spend money just because I have money. Mm -hmm. I don't like to be frivolous about it. Um, I think that I, I truly adore traveling. I love to travel. I probably I would indulge more of that I'd go first class on you know, all of the top end cruise ships and have a suite and do a, an around the world or a half world you know, cruise that takes four months or something like that. That would be my height of luxury. Um, I wouldn't be spending it on a lot of jewelry. Um, I probably would indulge in a house. I mean, Anna's situation where she has this house with two acres and this what it sounds like a stunning garden is very, very appealing. So rather than investing in a she shed, I would <laughs> invest in a full house, uh, you know, with lots of room for my books and everything else. Um, but I, I, I probably would treat and be kind to other people, certainly family members, certainly um, people that I know who I feel could really use a little, you know, a lift, uplift or a little hand I would do that very willingly. And what about your second cousin twice removed who comes out of the woodwork and tells you that you're related? Well, there, there, would, there would be a great interview there. So tell me what your story is. What do you need this money for? You know, and <laughs> what are we talking about? I mean, I'd probably grill him or her uh, to find out. Um, um, you know, you do have to be prudent. It's not that you're trying to be selfish or mean, but I do think you have to, to think with your head on your shoulders. And, and not just make foolish decisions. What about uh, you, I, Anna? Anna? Yeah. <laughs> what would I do if I won the lottery? <laughs> um, I, I would probably give most of it away for charity, actually. I find myself doing that. I'm a sucker for every ASPCA, World Wildlife Fund, the polar bears are dying, the elephants are dying, commercial that comes across my TV. 
I um, love to do volunteer work. So I would probably give as much of it away as I could, but I don't want anybody to know that it's me. Right, right. I would want to do it all anonymously. Um, well, you are both amazingly altruistic people. <laughs> okay, one quick last question, um, which is, what are you reading right now? Give us a recommendation. Oh my goodness. It's a book that I just received in the mail from someone. It's called The Safe Place. It's a summer suspense novel uh, that takes place on a vacation island. The author is Anna Downs, D-O-W-N-E-S. Never heard of her, never heard of the book. But as I said, someone did send it to me. So I figured this would be my next read. It looks like it's fun. It's a suspense. It's contemporary. Uh, takes place at a kind of a vacation setting. So that's it. That's what I'm about, about to start. I hope it is good as you hope it is. Okay, thanks. So, Anna, what about you? What are you reading? I am in the middle of a Susan Brandt book called Isle of Dreams. It's her third book in her um, graphic biography, autobiography series that she calls it. And I love her books. If you're not familiar with her books, they're, they're wonderful. Um, I got addicted to one called A Fine Romance where she talks about a month long trip through England and she draws these most beautiful watercolors all over the margins. And it's just a, a, a fabulous book. And so I I got addicted to her books through those. And so my, my Christmas gift to myself last year was the last two books of hers that I didn't have in my series. So I, I went through and I have them now. But the other book that I always keep at my bedside table, you'll laugh, but it's the Groucho Letters. It's the collected letters of Groucho <laughs> Mark. Because no matter how bad of a day I'm having, if I pick it up and I read a couple of his letters, it makes me realize that nothing is beyond absurd and it makes me laugh and it just, it just wonders for me right before I go to bed. So I, I love that. that as well. That is so random. It's amazing. <laughs> um, I'm just going to throw in there that um, I am halfway through the dating playbook by Farah Rashan and oh. it is so good. So you should go back and read the Boyfriend Project, which is the first one in the dating um, playbook, just came out. They're okay. fantastic. Okay. Uh, just, to get, just to get a romance recommendation in there, <laughs> in our romance book club. Right. Okay. So thank you, Anna. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, everybody you who know. has participated in the book club today. Sourcebooks has put the uh, winners in the chat. So if you are a winner, please email Lizzie Lewandowski. Her email is in the chat also to claim your prize. And thank you everyone who joined us. Make sure to join us next month on Wednesday, September 15th at 7 p.m. Eastern for a panel featuring Debbie, Debbie Burns, Kate McMurray, and Denise Swanson. And I have all their books lined up to read next. So I'm very excited for that. I love reading both of your books also. Again, Sandra Kit. Oh my God, it's like bookending parts of my life. This is like so exciting. Thank you. Thank you. And Anna, I did not think I would be reading Marvel in the Regency. So thank you for introducing me to something I didn't know that I wanted, but evidently <laughs> I did. Yeah, thank uh, you for having me. It was wonderful. Oh, it was so much fun. Thank you both. Yes, uh, thank you for having us. Put the link, I'm sorry, I'm trying to like finish my thing before they cut us <laughs> off. Okay. Ah, the link for next month is in the chat right now. So you can sign up right now. They'll send an email follow up to all of you. <sighs> okay, relax, slow down. Thank you so <laughs> much i had so much fun chatting with you we could thank talk you. for like another hour i still have questions so <laughs> thank you and we will see everybody else next month thank you anna thank you sandra enjoy your summer mm -hmm. sandra i know you're a summer person i think yes. you're crazy but <laughs> enjoy the heat in uh in new york city anna enjoy your two acre garden with four roses i'm very jealous thank you thank you everyone good night good night anna